Hi, Tim Jarvis, AIA Vitality Ambassador, Environmental Scientist and Polar Explorer, and I'm talking to you from a, a wonderful spring day here in Melbourne, uh, but about some very important issues, and I'm lucky to be joined by a range of experts from the Asia Pacific region to talk about these issues, and they relate to the very real links that exist between the health of the environment and an individual's personal health, and a, perhaps a bigger issue than that why we are failing to get the kind of necessary traction and action on issues like climate change. I'm just delighted as part of the AIA Voices campaign to be joined by Dr. Renard Sue and Malati Weissen from uh, KL and Indonesia respectively uh, to talk about these issues. And the goal of this is to show people how they can live healthier, longer, better lives. So Renard, I thought I'd start off with an easy one. First of all, it's great to, great to see you on, 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 this, on this call and to have your opinion. In my experience, there seem to be a few blockages here. One is the sort of scale of the issue one is the fact that people perhaps don't think it's real, although I think we've finally kind of got past that one. And the other one is, you know, people don't know what it is they have to do and maybe don't know why it's important for them to act. And is, is actually using the fact that the health of the environment and their individual personal health are so closely related a good way to get people to want to change? You as a doctor maybe would like to comment on that one. Yeah, as a start, I think there is a lack of this sense of urgency. And this could be attributed to the way that we communicate about the impacts of climate change. Uh, typically, there's a lot of technical jargon that's laden around this uh, topic area, but it doesn't really get down to, you know, like trying to help a lay person understand the real impacts of this. So people don't connect the dots, right, between climate change and floods and droughts. And we need to have that sort of more transparent dialogue around this area. Increasingly, there's this concept of planetary health that has come up to the fore. And it really describes sort of the close interlinkage between taking you know, good care of the planet, the environment, and, and the effect that this has has on health. So just to give you an example, air pollution, uh, for instance, actually leads to about 6 million premature deaths in developing countries. Mismanagement of waste actually you know, contributes to about 400,000 to about 1 million deaths every single year. So this is a huge problem. Uh, of course, you know, we, we spoke about the urgency of the climate crisis. Scientists have warned that we only have less than a dozen of years left uh, to cap temperatures from increasing by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, we will be seeing you know, more extreme weather events, right? Floods, droughts, you know, forest fires you know, that, that has already uh, take, taken place in Australia. All of this has a devastating impact on livelihoods and, and our health and, and well-being at the end of the day. Hi, Malati. A simple warm-up question then. Why is there a lack of action on climate change? Thanks, Tim. That was uh, uh, for what should have a simple answer for such a simple question. Um, I think it has a little bit more layers and complexity. I think Renard also mentioned the fact that there's a, a big communication gap and an understanding gap when it comes to the climate crisis. But I also have to say that as a young change maker, what we see is very much the lack of implementation of the big goals being announced. There are voluntary pledges instead of legally binding agreements. And I think that this is the next big step that we need to see in order to move from grassroots actions into the systemic changes that we want to see. Oh, look, I think that's that's brilliantly said. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that the International Climate Dialogue really ultimately is a voluntary thing because all the legally binding stuff are really the procedural elements uh, of, of the international climate deal and the, the actual levels to which individual countries commit is really still voluntary and the bar is being set far too low. So. How do young yeah. people particularly react to that? Because we've got a big issue with, I know, climate anxiety particularly. And what can they do apart from saying, hey, you know, next generation, please make, uh, me, please make some changes. You've caused this problem. 
Mm -hmm. I think young people, what we do best is lead by example. We don't want to wait until we're older to start creating change or to live healthier, longer and better lives. So young people today are taking action into their own hands and you know, reinventing systems, building new enterprises and making new innovations. Because we know one thing for sure is that we don't have the luxury of time to wait until we're older or to wait for the policy change to take place. So that's where we're seeing young people you know, look at linear systems and turn them circular look at challenges and take them into opportunities and I think that this is um, the skill that young people have of resilience but also the ability to think outside of the box and be creative. Oh, I think it's wonderf wonderfully said and it's very encouraging for someone like me who's now in my 50s and I remember when I was at the Rio Environment Conference in my 20s someone my age then said to me hey 20-something guy you know don't let this happen on your watch and now I'm saying it to the next kind of generation of 20 something saying the same thing. So how do we avoid that happening again where the can gets kicked down the road? And what can an individual do to, other than lobbying and, 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 and living a good life themselves, is there any kind of advice you'd give to, 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 a, to a young person to say, this is the, this is the, these are the top three things you can do to make a difference? Yeah, there's a long list for sure. And I think that the first thing I always try and say is that we, there's not one way to create change. There's not one organization or one person who's going to solve the entire climate crisis. So we need every single person to contribute their unique skills to the movement. So are you a writer? Are you a researcher? Are you a scientist, a public speaker? We need every single skill in this movement. So don't worry, don't feel intimidated. We need you. So, so maybe just to answer Tim's uh, question earlier around what are some of the uh, simple steps that we can take. I, I think I think that that's quite quite a critical question. A, a lot of people get scared scared by the severity, right, of uh, the environmental challenges that we face. But it really starts from uh, baby steps, right? Progress over perfection. Very simple things like joining a beach cleaning activity, and also through Malati's uh, great work and, and through Bye Bye Plastics, I think she has really started off a, a campaign, right, a whole movement uh, to, to get people going. The planet kind of came in to see you as a GP. What would what score would you give the planet in terms of its personal health? Are we on life support? Are we reasonably healthy? Can we do better? If so, what? Where would we be? Where would we score? I would say on a scale of one to ten, uh, with one with, with ten being you know extremely critical, I would say that we are sort of sitting on an eight to to a nine uh, in terms of rating. So our planet is really sick. Like we're seeing you know like issues not just around air pollution, you know that's massive deforestation that's happening to give way to uh, industrialization and economic boom. We're seeing uh, issues around plastic pollution. I mean in this very day and age, we are already seeing microplastics, right? Entering our, our food systems and our bloodstreams. I think all of this is are, are critical issues. Anything, any harm that you do to the environment comes back to affect our health in one way or, or another. So, so it is a very critical issue and, and we have to start taking action. I think it's fantastic. I think, I think, you know, no single solution to it. Look, I do expeditions to remote places and I'm, I'm always conscious when I have teams of people, everyone's different. And if you want them to all pull in the same direction to achieve a singular expedition outcome, you've got to understand that they're all different and you've got to use different language to get each one of them to want to be part of this collective effort. Maybe we need to apply the same thing to the climate piece. Everyone has a different role to play and are reached using slightly different messaging and uh, you know, given that we're here talking as part of AIA Voices, is the health of an individual and the benefits to someone's health something we need to be making more of? You know, if we if we can keep the planet healthy, it makes you healthy. Is that a is that a message we should be really pushing? Definitely, and I think Renard and Tim, both of you mentioned, you know, throughout the conversation, the importance of the communication aspect. Because not only are we in a climate crisis, we are also in a communication crisis. And I can share this simply with an example or a story or two of what happened, what I've experienced here in the classrooms in Indonesia. A lot of the work I do revolves around changing mindset. And to give you an idea why communication is key is because I remember going into a classroom one day and really having this you know, this uh, a struggle in the connection towards why the plastic problem is a problem in the first place. And then we switched tactics and started to ask questions like this. Um, you know, we see traditionally here very often in everyday life, people collecting piles of plastic on the side of the road and setting it on fire. 
children are playing around the burning fire and inhaling that smoke without thinking twice about the damages that that has on their personal health. But when we ask them the question, would you turn on a motorbike and put your mouth at the canal pot and breathe in that air? They all go, no, of course not. But then we say, the same toxins and smokes that you're inhaling from the burning plastic is just as bad, if not even worse. Suddenly, with that communication and storytelling, there's a shift in mindset. So I think this definitely needs to be applied towards the communication, uh, towards the climate crisis and seeing how we can make storytelling a really big pivotal movement for people to create change. Oh, look, I think that's so well said. You're relating it back to what an individual individual can do and, and relating it back in that case to their personal health, which I think is, is, is so crucial. Given, given that we're talking about health and mental and emotional health and physical health, how do you maintain your health in the face of all the stress of taking this issue on and being a, a, a leader in your community? Does it take a toll? Oh, definitely. I've been, since 12 years old to 21, nearly half of my life I've been on the front lines of creating change. And as many you know, things that are to celebrate, it is also extremely frustrating that change is happening too slowly. And we see this expressed in a lot of Gen Z. I mean, now I'm entering rooms and it's, it's empowering now that I'm not the youngest one anymore. There's so many people getting involved at a younger and younger age, but at the same time, a lot of what drives us is this climate anxiety that almost 70% of Gen Z experience. We feel this overwhelmed to what's happening in the outside world. And what are the ways that we tackle this mentally, physically? The first thing is to open up in conversation. Opening up about how this feeling is overwhelming and maybe being surprised that you find a friend in the community that experiences the same thing. I think that community building is something that Gen Z does really well, but it's also like we've discussed with Renard in terms of like spending time in nature, reminding yourself of why you do what you do. I mean, I can show you a simple example of why I'm so connected deeply to the natural world. I, I'm sitting right now in my childhood home and my parents made a very big point to me and my sister, never to cut down trees and they literally didn't cut this tree down. Instead, it's in the middle of our living room. Um, and these roots remind me every single day of why I do what I do. It's the love and the beauty of the natural world. It's something we have to all be so grateful for. But if we're not connected to it, if we don't see it every day, it sometimes can get hard. So that's why I also think um, when, we, when I was listening to you and Renard, uh, you know, to make schools and the education curriculums, making it mandatory for young people at a young age, no matter if they're in a city or on an island like Bali, but to integrate themselves with nature, it should be mandatory. Yeah, I totally agree. I would give that tree a hug if I were you. I think I think, <laughs> I think it deserves it. Hey, look, Reynard, we're just talking about uh, health and, and I mentioned before, you and I discussed using the fact that people have a vested interest in maintaining the health of the environment because their health in turn depends on a healthy environment. But are you seeing a lot of people coming to you with kind of um, uh, health related issues to do with the stress of dealing with, dealing with this issue, dealing with climate change and dealing with this kind of apparent futility in the face of such a big issue? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we've picked up right through our conversation with, with Malati and yourself was around eco-anxiety. And as a flood survivor, uh, having grown up in the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia, I have personally seen firsthand the devastation that this has, not just on people's livelihoods, you know, losing their homes, their, their assets, not being able to go to school as, as a result of that. I, I think it's really painful to see that, you know, this is a recurring event. And one, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is the mental health of children um, growing up through such uh, traumatic uh, events, such catastrophes. And I think increasingly this is becoming an issue that, that needs to be explored. It's certainly being raised uh, by researchers, academicians, um, although at, at its very nascent stage. But, you know, this is a dialogue that we need to have more of around eco-anxiety and what are some of the things that uh, we can do, right, in order to provide that, that sort of support, that, that network uh, for, for this uh, victims. What are some of the things we can do in our daily lives that can help both improve our personal health, but also the health of the planet? Yeah, I mean, there's a study that says that, you know, we would be able to cut down about 70% of our current 
global emissions through simple behavioral modification. So it's really simple and straightforward things such as you know including more vegetarian or vegan meals in, in our diet, uh, opting for carpooling or use the public transportation as much as possible, and even switching off uh, electricity when, when we're not using this. I think all of these simple steps actually add up. You know, cumulatively, you know, like we, we are sort of moving towards an exponential growth in population, so every action counts. There is so much that we can all do on an individual level, as much as we can on a, on a systemic wide level. But I think for me, the, what I can share today is this way of life that we have here in Bali. It's not a religious thing, it's not connected to a religion, it's simply a way of life. And it's called Trihita Karana. This is where we live in harmony with the community around us, the environment around us, and the spirit within. And I answer with this concept because I think, imagine the world we would live in if we all broke it down and, and lived in this harmony with those three elements. And then to break it down even further, Tim, the last thing I will say is that um, I, I like to give this an, um, story or this feeling where people can imagine themselves in a bubble. And this bubble goes one meter in front of you, one meter to the side, above you, below you, and everywhere you go, whether it's to the supermarket, to the beach, to school, wherever you are, you are responsible for the one meter bubble around you. Everything within that one meter is your responsibility to make sure is safe, is clean, is healthy, is not being destroyed by plastic pollution. Imagine the world we would live in if we can just break it down like that. Oh, I think that's so well said. I, I did some work a few years ago looking at how many hectares of land that humanity had sort of taken from nature to change to cities, roads, growing wheat, growing rice, football pitches. And at the time the work was done, it was 14 billion hectares and there were 7 billion of us. And we divided 14 billion hectares we'd taken by the 7 billion of us there were. And it meant each of us only had two hectares from which we had to derive everything, our holidays, our education, our our car, our tuk-tuk, our, our, our meals, our clothes, and it really focuses the mind when you think that's all we've got if we're going to share this equally between us. Uh, and yet you look at the consumption levels in some countries, they are five or six times that. And we have to really think very, very carefully about how we, we try and restrict the amount we consume. And maybe think less about material wealth as a means to grow as people, but think more about spiritual and emotional health and physical health as a means to, to develop and to grow and to put back. And I think if we can start to kind of get away from this sort of crude proxy of just acquiring stuff uh, and think more about life experiences and helping one another and putting back, I think we'd all be so much, so much better off and probably a lot more emotionally and mentally uh, happy uh, into the bargain. Well, look, this has just been a, a completely fascinating conversation. Uh, a big thanks to Malati Weissen, a big thanks to Dr. Renard Sue. Thank you for your comments, your thoughts, your observations, your energy and your commitment to this cause. And importantly, some of the tips you've given to people as to how they can make a real difference to this apparently existential issue of planetary decline. I think we can halt it, we can reverse it. And the great news is too, that there's not only uh, doing it for the planet's health, but you're also doing it for your own mental, physical and emotional well-being too. And a big thanks too to AIA for supporting this AIA Voices campaign, for having this conversation, for getting all of us together. It's been great to talk. Often it's a very lonely road. And for also giving us things that we can do to help us all live healthier, longer, better lives. So thanks for everything you do and um, hope to meet in person at some stage. <laughs>